To summarize, I would say that the opposition couldn't be weaker uh, than it is now in terms of the entire history of the United States. So yes, there are a few people around, um, but no, there's no organized uh, concrete movement. There's just no discourse, and the reason I think is if you question U.S. militarism after 9-1-1, you are giving uh, indirect support to terrorism. You're an enemy of the state, in the home of the brave, in the land of the free, where we believe in democracy and free speech. And we have no space for free speech for anyone who questions any aspect of the U.S. military construct. So I've been asked to talk about the political economy of U.S. military interventions and recent changes. So I see this as having two parts. Uh, the political economy of U.S. military interventions and then recent changes. And I've been in Germany for a week and in only a week there's a great deal of recent changes to discuss regarding Iraq, uh, regarding the displacement of a government which the United States appointed. But I won't talk about that tonight because I can't read German and the only newspapers I've found have been in German. So um, I'm a little behind on my subject. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we're going to have a simultaneous uh, translation, and uh, consequently I have a text, and I will be following the, the text. Uh, I apologize to those who find uh, the reading of a text to be undesirable. Um, I want to begin with uh, some divisions that were made by a political economist named Richard Falk. He's very well known. He's worked on aspects of uh, U.S. intervention for many decades. He's very respected. And so Richard Falk um, argued recently, this year, that the post-World War II era of U.S. interventions occurred for three systemic reasons. Um, I, I want to go further than Falk went, but I think this is a good way to begin. First, the first is the post-colonial setting. And uh, he argues that this allowed for U.S. interventions as exercises of hegemonic power in the global south. Here, quote, the U.S. will tend to justify its actions by setting forth an altruistic and unselfish argument. Invariably, these north-south interventions provoke national resistance. And the U.S. leaves the battlefield without a victory and frequently with a clear defeat. As in Vietnam, as in Iraq, and as in Afghanistan. However, neither uh, direct economic interests or broader geopolitical structures are acknowledged by the US. As we know, the first casualty of war is always the, the truth. And as a consequence, it is extremely difficult to document the basic political economy, direct or structural, of U.S. interventions through an analysis of any particular intervention. 
since intellectual hegemony hinges on the consent that the U.S. populace grants for such interventions. The national security state, which is a state within the state, is a highly sophisticated apparatus that exercises its relative autonomy with great discretion. A careful analysis of any particular intervention will not yield significant documentation regarding the material roots of the intervention. The policymakers within the national security state are ever alert to maintain the moral legitimacy of U.S. interventions. There are cases of U.S. interventions where the material roots have been well documented. Nonetheless, such events ha have not displaced the intellectual hegemony through which the populace consents to grant the U.S. military apparatus near complete latitude to act as it will. Two well-documented cases wherein the direct material interests of, of U.S. capital drove interventions, the overthrow of the Arbenz government in Guatemala and the Mossadegh regime in Iran, both in the 1950s, are now recalled by very few. Most of the almost immeasurably small portion of the U.S. populace that have any recollection of these two interventions would associate them with the rhetoric of the Cold War. Only in the rarest of instances did functionaries at the lower level of the national security state confirm the views of critics who stress the material basis for intervention. The onset of the neoliberal era, largely commencing with the Reagan administration, ushered in a new period of quiescence and social conformity that did not inspire many critiques of the national security state. Neoliberalism is a complex, quickly metamorphosing doctrine with many objectives, including the depoliticization of the vast underlying population. Since Vietnam, and this is the second point regarding Falk's analysis, since Vietnam, great care has been given to the maintenance of consent. And I'm using this in a Gramscian framework. So great care has been given to the maintenance of consent through disengagement with the realities of interventions. President Carter began the reconstruction of U.S. military intervention uh, capabilities after Vietnam with the Rapid Deployment Force. Such new capabilities allowed for lightening U.S. intervention in Panama. If there were material interests which would explain this intervention, and there were, such underlying causes were not sought out as attention quickly shifted to other events um, because the war ended as a lightning war. In this case, the U.S. was determined to reassert its hegemony over the crucial maritime choke point, the Panama Canal, and ensure its unrivaled power in the Caribbean region. Shock and awe were, the, were thought to be the weaponry that would bring Iraq under U.S. dominance before the U.S. populace had an opportunity to react. In this instance, as Falk has emphasized, national Iraqi resistance quickly formed and a prolonged battle ensued. And I should add, lasting till this very moment. Fast intervention conducted with an array of high-tech weaponry is designed to assure that relatively few U.S. military personnel are killed in action. Thus, there is a constant substitution of capital for manpower in the field of battle for many reasons, 
One being that U.S. corpses quickly pierced the fog of intellectual hegemony so carefully constructed to ensure U.S. citizen consent for the applications of military force in distant South nations. Interventions then have been facilitated through new processes and procedures that have been carefully constructed to create a sufficient degree of autonomy to permit the U.S. state to project power and intervene without broad societal resistance. Nonetheless, prolonged engagements due to creative forms of asymmetric national resistance, as in Iraq, regularly erode and degrade social consent. The erosion of consent can be forestalled to a considerable degree due to well-entrenched allegiance to U.S. militarism. Militarism has been defined as individual and societal deference to all things military, including the military definition of reality. Militarism has its deepest roots in the U.S. South, where valor and unquestioning patriotism have long been held up as the highest of values. Today, U.S. military bases are spread throughout the U.S. South. With the end of, the na of, of national military service in the, in the 1970s, a multi-generational cast of military families has been formed, with the South now constituting its strongest representation. Thus, the ideological hegemony needed to enable near-constant military intervention since the end of the Cold War is not structurally fragile, but neither is it unassailable. Whatever calamitous conditions are provoked by U.S. interventions, a vociferous portion of the populace embodies unmitigated support for U.S. military policy. Another portion of the population, always risking the accusation of treasonous practices, embraces a counter-hegemonic position either as pacifists or because of their underlying understanding of the structural political economy of U.S. interventions. At any moment in time, a vast portion of the U.S. populace has no strong commitment to either the permanent militarist faction or to those who have an a priori position of opposition. Under conditions of prolonged military engagement, this structurally uncommitted um, portion of the populace which has been easily manipulated, slowly and quietly withdraws its consent for a long-term exercise in U.S. power projection. This is normally encapsulated by the press as war fatigue or some other sweeping term that, that is adopted by the mass media, such as the Vietnam, Vietnam Syndrome. Manufactured consent, then, can be challenged at crucial conjunctures. Nonetheless, the deeper structural inertial forces tend time and again to reassert the intellectual hegemonic position of U.S. militarism. Third, Falk maintains that the rise of support for humanitarian uh, rights also serves to justify U.S. interventions since the U.S. can assume the role of the guarantor of such rights through power projection. Interventions thus become quote-unquote humanitarian. President Obama's core civilian advisors at the State Department, at the United Nations, and at the National Security Council are firm champions of this position. An author, Mario Aguirre, notes that under this rubric, the U.S. and the United Kingdom have deliberately sown confusion 
by combining the concept, this concept with interventionism, rather than humanitarian assistance, as well as by tying the concept of regime change, uh, by tying the concept to regime change and selectively applying the concept when it fits within the structural parameters of the political economy of intervention. This author further notes that the U.S. has sought to manipulate the concept of humanitarian assistance as a means to, one, delegitimize the United Nations, two, legitimate NATO, quote, as an extension of U.S. power to replace the United Nations and set up a firewall against any attempt to establish an international force under the U.N. mandate, and three, to promote the concept that the U.S. is the only, um, the only nation that has leadership capacity in the face of international crises. Now I move to the structural political economy of U.S. interventions. The structural political economy of U.S. interventions varies little from that of England during the long hegemonic reign. These structural conditions were well analyzed, above all, by Rosa Luxemburg and also the U.S. critical thinker Thornstein Veblen who had an acute understanding of the construction and use of ideological hegemony, particularly via U.S. militarism. Luxembourg and Veblen, each in their manner, gave shape to the political economy of militarism during the closing period of British hegemony. U.S. hegemony was shaped during and after World War II when the Grand Area as it was called, um, became a new sphere of U.S. influence. This new sphere of influence expanded the Pacific region and the Caribbean, which had been so defined um, in the 1890s. The new configuration now folded in the Middle East number one, and then Western Europe. Later, during the early 1950s, Japan and Korea were added. As the U.S. reached outward in new forms, it also underwent an internal transformation. In short order, excuse me, a huge military industrial base was built. The rapid construction of this industrial base coincided with the creation of public policies that ended the Great Depression. Deficit spending, later formalized by Keynes and Kalecki, did not end the Depression, but deficit spending to complete war orders did. Not only was it possible now to offset the low profit rate through rentier deals at what was then known as the War Department, Military expenditures were also linked to plant modernization and more especially to research, development, testing, and evaluation of new and frequently path-breaking technological innovations that had sweeping applications to the civilian economy after World War II. Securing the Middle East was a strategic part of the plan, at first as a means of achieving unquestioning hegemony over oil-starved Europe. Later, this became a policy to also maintain continuity and forward momentum as the U.S. oil fields became depleted and the U.S. became the largest importer of oil. More broadly, as Harry Magdoff has illustrated, resource dependence on the global south was sufficient reason when, quote, necessary to mount U.S. interventions. 
These interventions range from active intelligence gathering to programs of political destabilization and low-level coercion through perhaps an IMF stabilization program. And on to outsized military assistance programs, to the encouragement of coups while operating under deep cover um, to counterinsurgency, to now unmanned aerial vehicles, popularly known as drones, to low intensity conflicts, to quick selective strikes, to war at a distance via superior air power, as in Libya recently, to boots on the ground, in quote, small wars, such as Afghanistan and Iraq, to full military engagements using what the United States military calls full-spectrum dominance, which means dominance of land, dominance of the sea, dominance of the air, and now dominance of space. Beyond such factors, most well analyzed by Rosa Luxemburg, the U.S. sought and gained market access as import substitution industrialization provided a viable uh, pr proved viable, excuse me, in many nations of the Global South after the Second World War. This was new, and it was an important aspect of uh, power projection policies. U.S. corporations demanded friendly governments in order to jump the tariff walls and quota barriers of these nationalist policies that were known as import substitution industrialization. Nations that begin to diverge from their destiny as defined by U.S. hegemony, such as Brazil in the 1960s, which extended their industrialization program to the nationalization of some U.S. oil refineries and other U.S. areas of investment, faced vast, complex, fast-moving destabilization programs followed quickly wherever necessary by military coups co-financed under deep cover by the United States. Parenthetically, I would add that the current president of Brazil was a victim of the U.S. stabilization policy in in Brazil in the 1960s and early 70s, you probably know. She was tortured, and this has changed the dynamic a great deal regarding how the U.S. can project power in Brazil. Moving onward, as the era of, of globalization, quote, unquote, arrived in the late 1970s, not least due to the civilian usage of military technologies such as containerization that revolutionized the economics of international transport, uh, capital began moving offshore to establish uh, production facilities and engage in high profit labor arbitrage. My reference to containerization has to do with the fact that the U.S. Navy invented containerization. The U.S. Navy invented containerized ports. This has been one of the most important technological innovations of the current era, revolutionizing international trade. Um, Maintaining this new option for capital, that is access to cheap labor, quickly became yet one more important reason for maintaining, quote, order, unquote, including via all the aforementioned forms of intervention. Another new and fundamental structural aspect of the political economy of U.S. intervention was the complex permanent war economy that was set in motion by the creation of the national security state itself. This permanent war economy, 
is composed of the military apparatus and its appendages on one side of the Iron Triangle, the state functionaries and policy makers on the other side, including the U.S. Congress, which carefully spreads military contracts through most of the states of the United States. Um, and at the base of the triangle, we find tens of thousands of military contracting firms. Ten years ago, there were approximately 68,000 U.S. corporations that were what were called first-tier military contractors. That is, they had direct contact, contracts with the Pentagon. At one time, the base of the Iron Triangle was also composed of unionized workers who were strong champions of more and more military spending. Today, the private sector unions um, control around 7% of the uh, private sector employment. At any rate, at any time, at least one portion of this iron triangle um, is exercising its power in Washington and elsewhere to expand military expenditures and to invent new apparatuses, such as the Office of Homeland Security, which was created in 2001 in the aftermath of the um, terrorist attack in New York. In many instances, the Iron Triangle became so fundamental to the functioning of the U.S. economy, particularly during recessions, that military expenditures ballooned without any reference whatsoever to any interventions. Here we find a vast state-guided institutional structure operating under conditions of limited state autonomy, even if their origins led back to programs once tied to military power projection. The Iron Triangle quickly became a perpetual motion machine. This had the to-be-expected effects of blowback, which then exercised the same effect. The greater the degree of U.S. interventions, the greater the degree of blowback, the greater the need for armaments, more bases, more new weapons, and the creation of spin-offs into the civilian economy. All of this was somehow explained until 1989 as a necessary offset to the practices of the Soviet Union. After a brief pause in the 1990s, ideological hegemony was once again reconstructed around the themes of humanitarian intervention, forestalling nuclear proliferation, and now terrorism. Recent changes. There are always intermittent recent changes, particularly in military technologies and in military strategies. In summary review, these would now include a focus on the unmanned aerial vehicles, the drones, which have allowed the Obama administration to assume deity-like powers to assassinate individuals wherever they may, may be found in the globe. As well, in terms of recent changes, the rise of special forces would register. These units have permitted another qualitative change in U.S. power projection capabilities in terms of the mobility and speed of force projection. Both lower the threshold barrier enabling the U.S. to intervene. Such interventionary capacity has allowed for rapid military actions in nations that are officially not hostile to the United States, such as in Pakistan in recent years. Um, U.S. interventions have now been revealed to be nearly ubiquitous. 
Mr. Snowden documented the reach of high technology intelligence weaponry in the course of 2013. I'll add parenthetically and unnecessarily that this reached into uh, Merkel's uh, inner circle, as you well know. Allies and enemies alike are subject to elaborate, deity-like electronic surveillance today. Analyzing these and related changes in U.S. military policy and strategy are of great importance, deserving a detailed examination, which I cannot present here. What I would like to focus on briefly uh, is the most recent um, confrontation between Obama and the extreme right, the um, what were known as the neoconservatives under the Bush administration. A few weeks ago, Obama gave a speech uh, to, I think it was West Point. These events are normally understood as critical moments when presidents may lay down what is called a doctrine. The press was expecting the articulation of the Obama doctrine, just as the Carter doctrine had been articulated um, at, at uh, one of the military academies in the late 1970s. <coughs> in fact, Obama did not articulate an Obama doctrine. Um, but one of the prominent, um, one of the most prominent, if not, if not the most prominent neoconservatives active today, a man named Robert Kagan, uh, had, prior to Obama's speech, written an essay in The New Republic which is one of the few uh, weekly or bi-weekly publications that will um, take a very critical stance regarding uh, administrations such as Obama's. Um, Kagan wrote a 60,000 word essay. I'm, some of you may have heard of the heard of the essay. Uh, I'll find the title. Superpowers Don't Get to Retire. Uh, if you're interested, this is the New Republic, May 26th. You can find it on the internet. It makes very interesting reading. Um, I would also like to say that Mr. Kagan uh, not only seems to be able to influence Obama and forced him to respond to this essay in his speech at West Point, but Mr. Kagan is also directly connected to uh, U.S. actions in the Ukraine. His wife is Victoria Newland. Uh, she's a former U.S. ambassador to NATO. She served at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. In 2010, she was named the U.S. Special Envoy for Conventional Forces in Europe. In 2003-2005, she served as the Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Cheney. She now is Obama's Special Advisor on uh, the former Soviet bloc in Eastern Europe. She's the individual who was caught by um, the Russian Federation Intelligence Services <coughs> 
using your cell phone to speak to somebody connected with the U.S. Embassy in the Ukraine, naming the person who took power as the government uh, toppled a few months ago in the Ukraine. So her husband is Kagan. And it, Obama was trying to respond to Kagan in his speech at West Point only a few weeks ago. What does Kagan have to say? Um, I'll just summarize a few things. Echoing the weary titan trope that was once deployed to explain the eclipse of British global political economic hegemony, Kagan suggests that the Obama's, Obama administration's lack of will to power, a lack of will to re-legitimate the underlying hypothesis of U.S. power projection, <clears throat> that U.S. interests happen to coincide with the broader interests of many nations. In the vision of U.S. conservatives, this assumed state of affairs demands the maintenance on the part of the U.S. populace of its historic sense of global responsibility. Given that U.S. exceptionalism provides a historically unique base from which the U.S. can project power, not for the purpose that all nations have pursued in the past, but solely as an expression of altruism or of divinely guided inspiration. Extreme and metaphysical as, as is this position, the center-right faction, which represents the alternative to the conservatives as expressed by the Clinton as well as President Obama, um, that the United States is the indispensable nation. Thus, the two poles of the ideological perspective expressed by the U.S. power elite essentially express one single position in support of an initiative to rally the populace to support the projection and the renovation of U.S. hegemony. Kagan expressing well the perspective of the neoconservatives who guided national policy through two presidential terms prior to Obama embraces apocalyptic terminology foreseeing a possible collapse of the world order for the neoconservatives, the Obama administration has presided over and has contributed to a period of U.S. retrenchment, wherein the world's only superpower has shirked its hegemonic responsibility of, quote, global activism, thereby weakening its allies and associates throughout the world. Hence, Kagan suggests the U.S. shows signs of entering a new phase of permanent withdrawal from the global responsibilities, from its global responsibilities, opening the way for what he calls a radically different alignment of the international system. What is the basis for Kagan's, what is the empirical basis for Kagan's discourse? Claiming without any evidence that the U.S. citizens possess a universalistic ideology, as did Republican Rome, according to the author, uh, which was best first articulated by President Wilson. This ideology only fueled hegemonic ambitions after World War II. From that point onward until the present, the prevailing and operative ideology of U.S of U.S. policymakers, both the realists and the idealists, as they're known, has, has been the promotion of U.S. hegemonic power as the means to establish and maintain a stable global order. Avoiding Hobbes' vision 
of a mutually destructive world required the consolidation of U.S. hegemony. This is for the mutual benefit of all. As the U.S. grand strategy was cast in the period from 43 to 50, and essentially reproduced since, Kagan claimed that the real revolution in U.S. policy was the adoption of a dynamic policy that exceeded the scope of U.S. national interests. Therefore, according to Kagan, the U.S. national security state is presumed to sustain a quality never claimed or granted to any other nation in all history, the ability to act in behalf of other nations' interests. Furthermore, unique to the U.S. was the ability to prevent a collapse, and I'm quoting him, to prevent a collapse of the global order. Power is the, is the ability to order. Unique to the U.S. was the capacity to use such power, as neoconservatives construe this process, in as benign a manner as, as possible. Um, Kagan deploys a form of reductionism that is truly remarkable. The role of the one indispensable nation essentially explains the trajectory of most nations over the past uh, seven decades. All this was accomplished by a nation that was unable to militarily defeat an anti-colonial peasant culture after a long and costly war in Vietnam. Kagan expresses the limitless U.S. narcissism embedded in the concept of exceptionalism emphasizing the high degree to which, quote, the rest of the nations in the liberal world order generally accepted and even welcomed America's overwhelming power. Who? When? Where? Certainly not in Latin America where U.S.-backed coups followed U.S.-backed coups under the leadership cadres that had been trained in the U.S. School of the Americas, which is located in the U.S. South. According to Kagan, although, US dominated, although the U.S. dominated liberal world order, quote unquote, lasted for seven decades, it now faces new structural conditions that threaten the future of the order. The U.S. has lost its will to power, according to Kagan, Polls show that a majority of the U.S. Po populace believe that the U.S. now exercises a much diminished role in preserving the world order than it once had. For Kagan, this would not necessarily matter except for the fact, and I'll quote him, the sense of futility has affected policymakers too. Senior White House officials, especially the younger ones, look at problems like the struggle in Syria and believe that there is little, if anything, the United States can do. This is the lesson of their generation, the lesson of Iraq and Afghanistan, that America has neither the power nor the understanding nor the skill to fix the problems of the world. And I will make a few more comments and close. Rather than determination to undergrid the order, the U.S. has been overtaken by the futility, by futility and escapism, according to Kagan. What is to be done? It is for the U.S. neoconservatives and most, if not all, of the center-right opposition to the neoconservative bloc, a simple case of hegemony or Hobbes's barbarism. U.S. hegemony allowed for 70 years, according to Kagan, of peace and prosperity, which existed because the U.S. had the will to power. 
Kagan overlooks a number of facts, all of which uh, reveal the profound U.S.-centric and Euro-centric perspectives that he adopts. And I, I'll just list a few of these things that occurred during these so-called seven decades of peace in order. Um, The 1947 partition of India estimated to take a half million to a million lives. The displacement of Palestine, 700,000 refugees. The exodus of, of the Vietnamese from north to south in 1954, between 600,000 and one million fled. The flight of the Pai Noa from Algeria, 800,000 exiled. The deaths resulting from Mao Zedong's quest for utopia, between 2 million and 5 million. The mass murder of, Indo of Indonesians during the anti-communist purges in the mid-1960s, a half million slaughtered. The partition of Pakistan in 1971, up to 3 million killed millions displaced. The genocide in Cambodia, 1.7 million dead in the early 1970s. The war between Iraq and Iran, at least 400,000 killed. Not to mention civil wars in Nigeria, Uganda, Burundi, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Sudan, Congo, Liberia, Sierra Leone, that kill millions. And the list goes on. Obviously, when Kagan talks about peace and order and prosperity, he cannot even conceive of the global south. As one might expect, it is Russian policy to this provoke Kagan and the neoconservatives to agonize over the future of U.S. dominance. And in fact, Russian policy since roughly 20, 2007 is something new, unanticipated, and bedeviling to U.S. policymakers who have used consent and coercion in tandem to maintain order. The largest recent changes of consequence, of consequence is not to be found in the latest evolution of weaponry, but rather in the fact that the hegemon has not encountered, has now encountered for the first time a wily an unbowed adversary that will not be intimidated, as the 2014 Ukraine crisis has demonstrated. U.S. policy is path-dependent. It's locked into a, reflect a reflexive pattern, unable and unwilling to learn from its long string of blunders and illusionary adventures. U.S. policymakers do not suffer a loss of will to power. Rather, the national security state is flummoxed. It is flummoxed over Syria. It is flummoxed over Iran. It is flummoxed over Russia's relatively recent assertiveness and creativeness. U.S. neoconservatives are probing the geopolitical power tensions in order to pull U.S. militarism toward a more conf confrontationist stance than that currently adopted by the Obama administration. I would like to edit that sentence because as we can see in the last week, the neoconservatives and Kagan's wife, I'm sure, have pulled the Obama administration willy-nilly back into Iraq. <clears throat> Where there is where this will lead is not a matter for speculation, however, but rather a matter for future observation. Two more comments. However, the neoconservatives, with direct access to the highest circles of power, know, in other words, they know, where it will lead. All nations base their geopolitical calculation strategies and policies on the basis of their capacity to use power to gain from other nations. All that is, according to the neoconservatives, except for the United States. 
Now, according to the neoconservatives, given that Obama has embraced um, Coco's hypothesis that the United States has limits, this is what he said in the West, um, the West Point speech a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Colco argued this hypothesis 30 or so years ago. The United States has limits. I think this is the first U.S. president in the post-war period to make that statement. Stating that the U.S. has limits, the signs of the global order breaking down are all around us, according to the neoconservatives. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the seizure of Crimea was the first time since World War II that a nation in Europe had engaged in a territorial conquest, according to Kagan. Finally, Kagan, having built his argument with nearly 60,000 words, is left only with the myth of failing exceptionalism to anchor his catastrophic vision. Quote, the U.S. project has aimed at shaping a world different from what had always been. Taking advantage of the U.S.'s unique situation to do what no other nation has ever been able to do. And uh, that is the end of my uh, presentation. I hope that I have at least given you some idea of how this discussion of recent changes is being played out in the U.S. at the moment. Die erste Frage, also wenn ich, wenn ich äh, diese Beschreibung höre von der Ideologie der Neocons, am Beispiel von diesen Kägen, frage ich mich wirklich ab einem gewissen Punkt immer, glauben die das wirklich selbst? Also ist, ist das eine bewusste, in, äh, sind die wirklich der Meinung oder ist es eine bewusste Irreführung der Menschen, um ihre Interessen durchzusetzen? Ähm, das ist die erste Frage. Die zweite Frage, was ich nicht verstanden habe in Bezug auf das eiserne Dreieck, ähm, ist die organisierte Arbeiterklasse, haben Sie irgendwie erwähnt, und deren Rolle in diesem Dreieck. Das habe ich nicht verstanden. Und die dritte Frage ist, ähm, ich habe vor einiger Zeit mal über diese politischen Destabilisierungsprogramme gelesen und äh, von sowas wie einem Stufenplan, aber ich habe das nie wieder gefunden. Äh, gibt es da eine Quelle irgendwo im Netz, weil immer, also bei manchen Leuten äh, wird man dann leicht in die Ecke von Verschwörungstheoretikern gestellt ähm, und dafür fehlt mir die Quelle. Well, um, the, the first part of the question, uh, what do the, what do the neoconservatives really believe in. Um, I would trace the, the neoconservative thinking back to the Montpellier Society, um, back, back to the basis of, of, of neoliberal thought. Um, in the case of the US invasion of Iraq, uh, the neoconservative role was to assume a quick military victory and then using force reconstruct the institutions of an entire society based upon the hypothetical arguments of uh, Hayek and Friedman and other, other members of the Montpellier society. Um, Definitely, they believe that you can restructure societies and construct a neoliberal order through military coups. They did that in Chile in 1973. And um, Chile has been restructured. There's, there's no question about it. Uh, now, 
So many years later, uh, we get what's known as the Polanyi effect. Polanyi argued that the, the neoliberal order, or what Polanyi really understood to be the order of the invisible hand, the, the market society, had been attempted in England uh, at the, in the closing period of the Industrial Revolution. And that by undercutting the entire network of institutions that supported human life for the majority of people and casting these people into a market environment had left them destitute but also had left them politically active. And in various ways, in a long struggle in the course of the 19th century and the early 20th century, the British working class and the British middle class, to some degree, had built a set of countervailing institutions to the market. So I think we do know what the neoconservatives believe in, in terms of what is their ultimate aim. And they believe in the use of force. They speak about democracy, freedom, endlessly. They do not believe in that. They don't believe that any other nation has the right to use force except the United States. They do believe in that. And they believe that the United States embodies exceptionalism, that only the United States, because of its Puritan tradition or exactly what, I mean, we could talk about that, but they believe only the United States is capable of acting without base motivations. So the invasion of, of Iraq, according to them, really was altruistic. They used a little violence. You know, they killed, uh, well, as they said in Vietnam, the military, the U.S. military said in Vietnam, not once, but over and over again, we do not do body counts. In other words, we will not tell you how many people our forces have killed. Nor will we tell you anything about displaced individuals or people who have been killed by active fire who were not the target of active fire. And the Pentagon invented the term collateral damage. Which they now use when the drones invariably miss their mark. Um, so, I, I think I should leave it at that in terms of what, what do they believe in. I, I, I've mentioned some of the things they believe in, and, and um, addressing that question directly, I think it's a wonderful question, but it would take the entire evening and then probably weeks and months of seminars and reading. I'll move to the second. Um, what was the union role in promoting military spending. Um, for one thing, right after World War II, most of the Union people were military vets. And so they were members of the four, uh, uh, veterans of foreign wars, what people in the U.S. call the VFW, and the American Legion. Uh, they had been conditioned by World War II to be soldiers, to accept authority, this, this is militarism. Uh, when the United States said, we need more military spending, we need missile systems, we need aircraft, we need a larger navy, whatever it was, uh, politically they tended to support that. And uh, they would rally around, uh, time and again, they would rally around the periodic increases in military spending. Um, they, uh, during the 50s and 60s, were much more politically active. Uh, they tended to be the, the people you could count on to go door to door in old industrial cities like Detroit. And they would support certain candidates. They would oppose others. 
they would oppose any candidate that wanted to limit the prerogatives of the Pentagon. Uh, both ideologically they consented and materially that was a threat to them. Where would the jobs be? Uh, many of these people were actually working in military plants. Their brothers were working in military plants. Their wives were mar working in military plants. The, the machinist union was almost the only union that would periodically take a stance in opposition to the periodic increases in military spending. And uh, there was one leader in particular named William Whippensinger. Uh, but he was an old conditioned uh, union leader and even though he tried to pull the machinists who were probably more deeply into the military industrial base than any union, uh, he would try to take a more, I wouldn't say pacifist, uh, the unions never liked uh, pacifists. Um, some of you may be old enough to know a little bit about the history of the Vietnam War. I was a militant during the Vietnam War. I was an opponent of the war. I was politically active as I thought I could be without being killed. Because the United States doesn't take easily to the idea of dissent. Um, or lose my job. And I had a family to support at the time. Um, but one of the things you could depend on during the Vietnam War is if you had a demonstration there was a very high likelihood that the union people would come to the demonstration uh, kind of like um, German skinheads to beat up the demonstrators. And they did that over and over again. There was violence and threats of violence. So you had, in a way, the unions not only participating in elections, um, but they were somewhat violent uh, stormtroopers in the regular um, marches, demonstrations that occurred throughout the Vietnam era. Hmm? Um, I've been a loyal union person all my life, <laughs> but I think the truth has to be said about where the unions were during this period. Third part of your question, the destabilization programs, could I give you a reference that you would find on the internet? I don't know uh, about that. I, I would think you could, but um, one of the things uh, that happened um, at some point when the U.S. was busy destabilizing uh, Chile was that someone got access to the documents by which the State Department, the embassy, was cooperating with a large company at that time known as IT&T. And there's a book uh, of documents, but it's a little book uh, that, that shows, in other words, these are actual do documents of the it and I'm sure if you went to a good library, and you could read Spanish. I don't know if it's been translated, but that would be my, m m the first reference that would come to mind. After that, um, I guess I would start digging away, but I don't think that's really going to be very hard to find. You could, you could revisit, and this would be in English, uh, certain neocon found foundations that were documented to be active in Venezuela a few years ago, if you remember, um, maybe around 2000, I can't remember the year exactly, but uh, Hugo, uh, Hugo Chavez was deposed. He was flown to a little island in the Caribbean, and within about 24 hours, he was back in power. The coup was announced. The U.S. recognized the new government, and then it was no more in about 24, maybe 48 hours. And then very quietly, the U.S. dropped 
it's a recognition of the government that it helped put in place. So that's another classic Latin American destabilization that, uh, that is in English, and you could find out. Also, was mich noch interessieren würde, ist ähm, die Frage, die Sie, äh, Herr Seifer, hinten am Ende Ihres Beitrages nochmal haben, äh, weshalb aus äh, der Perspektive der Analyse der Politik der USA es zu dieser neuen Zuspitzung des Verhältnisses zu Russland gekommen ist. Sie machen dann Hinweis, also da die Amerikaner oder die USA keinen Zugriff auf die russischen Ölquellen äh, und Gasvorräte erreicht haben, reagieren sie mit Gewalt. Gleichzeitig haben wir natürlich die Situation, dass die USA, äh, Quatsch, äh, dass, dass Russland äh, ja im Falle der Krim selber äh, äh, Gewalt angewendet hat, was wiederum äh, ja dazu geführt hat, dass die Obama-Administration äh, gerade diesen Punkt als einen großen Einschnitt verstanden haben, in dem Sinne, dass sozusagen die von Ihnen äh, garantierte Weltordnung damit in Frage gestellt worden ist. Also zu diesen Aspekten des äh, US-amerikanisch-russischen äh, Verhältnisses gerade vor dem Hintergrund der neueren Entwicklung interessiert mich doch, äh, dass Sie vielleicht noch ein paar äh, Bemerkungen dazu machen, ein bisschen mehr als Sie in Ihrem Vortrag hatten. Uh, yes, uh, that entire uh, range of questions has been very much on my mind. <clears throat> I have here a article from the New York Times, June 10, and is entitled The Sanction Dance. The subtitle, For Western Oil Companies, Expanding in Russia Takes Finesse. You're probably aware that there was a very large uh, business uh, conference in St. Petersburg uh, maybe six weeks or so ago. And uh, uh, the Obama administration made it very clear that U.S. corporations were not to appear. And most didn't. And apparently the idea of this uh, Congress, or whatever it was called, was to strike deals um, with uh, foreign investors and to have high-level discussions on uh, the, the, the co-participation, co-investments, uh, Russian companies and international companies. So this article is about how Uh, the major oil companies did not uh, show much of a profile at that St. Petersburg conference, but that nonetheless, um, they are signing huge deals. And it documents uh, some of the activities of corporations like Exxon um, and uh, uh, co-investments with... Um, the major uh, Russian uh, companies. Uh, in, in particular, I think the U.S. has a, a very strong advantage in, in shale, uh, shale gas wells. Uh, and the Russians have apparently a great deal of shale gas, uh, particularly around Shakalin Island, uh, but in the general Siberian region, and apparently also in the Urals. So on the one hand, we have this holy war crusade going on. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we have continued cooperation between large capital and the Russian state. Very interesting uh, conjuncture. Um, I would say since uh, uh, I shift between Mexico and the United States rather constantly. Um, one of my recent trips to the United States was when the Ukraine crisis was coming to a boil and when the uh, Russian Federation made the decision which the realists argued was the only decision they could possibly make in the face of the Ukraine crisis, which was to assert their 
outright control of the Crimea. Hmm? Chomsky often says, take the example and then reverse it. Hmm? So you, the U.S. press went more rabid, more insane than ever I have seen in my lifetime. Day after day, you could open the New York Times, which is the official newspaper of reference, and you could go down the editorial page. There's one page in the first section, the editorial page. Virtually impossible to publish on that page because of the impact an editorial is going to have in the United States from those points of reference in the press. I'd never seen anything close to this. There might be five editorials on the page, or six. Let's say six. It wouldn't have been surprising to see four of the six making reference to either outright or in a veiled fashion the inevitable inevitableness of World War III. The favorite trope now, as you know, is everybody's worse than Hitler. Gaddafi was worse than Hitler when NATO, which was really the United States, with its lapdog, NATO, went into Libya. The United States had done deals with Gaddafi for, what, 25 years, a quarter of a century. Gaddafi would sometimes resist, but not so much. And then suddenly he was worse than Hitler. Saddam Hussein was worse than Hitler. He'd worked 20 years or more in cooperation with the CIA. All this is well documented. Um, but uh, he was not... At, the, uh, at a couple of crucial moments in time, he was not following 100% the line that the U.S. wanted followed. And any, any national leader who diverges is in a difficult situation uh, and can become tomorrow's worse than Hitler. So, of course, when Putin, uh, which was not Putin, I mean, Russia has a, a government, uh, you would think, you know, every, every decision is simply coming out of the forehead of Putin. But Putin suddenly became not somebody who Bush said, I could look into his eyes and see that we understood each other. This was Bush Jr.'s approach to meeting Putin. Maybe you remember that, maybe you don't. Um, Putin went from that, somebody we can do deals with, to worse than Hitler. Um, so uh, what we have here in the Russian situation is we have the realist approach, which is Siberia has buku of oil resources and every other kind of mineral resources you can imagine, and not just Siberia, and that U.S. companies want to do deals, as they even did during the Cold War, Arm and Hammer and Occidental Oil did deals with, with the Soviet Union. So we have the realist approach, and then we have the idealist approach, and we have, of course, Kagan's wife stirring the pot, uh, as best uh, as best you can. Um, I, I I don't have closure closure on this. Uh, I I'm following this. As I said, I think these kind of events don't yield to uh, any any grand vision whereby we can read uh, we can read the future. Um, I do think there is something that is often not considered in these, these situations, uh, whatever they may, may be. You know. And I understand now in Europe, particularly in France, there's a certain kind of a apocalyptic thinking amongst the intellectuals that this has been uh, 
fashionable for three or four hundred years. It comes and goes, and apparently, at least in France and some other parts of Europe, there's a certain amount of apocalyptic uh, thinking. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you revisited things like the um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which was perhaps the worst moment of the Cold War, there's something else that goes on here behind the press, behind the curtain, etc. And at least for the U.S. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to sound Pollyannish about this. I, I think this is something that's real, it's simple to say. Uh, and that is there's a certain kind of, of, of pragmatism. There's a lot of posturing, but there's a certain kind of pragmatism that has, uh, in, in big cases, not in small situations like Iraq, where maybe you're only killing a million people or so, right? But in the, in the, in the situations where um, really big questions hang in the balance, there's been this tradition in the United States of having a certain projection, an ideological projection, and then a fallback position that, that is pragmatic. Um, could I say one last thing about this? Um, um, there was something known as the long telegram um, that was written at the beginning of the Cold War um, by a famous uh, U.S. diplomat whose name, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, can you help me? Uh, uh, it'll come to me the minute I don't want to uh, re recall. Um, but um, Kinnan. Uh, who'd, who'd been working in, in Russia long before the idea of the Cold War was percolating upwards. He had a, quite a history. Uh, and uh, he took the position, which not remarkable really, um, that the Soviet Union had no intention of any kind of sweeping campaign uh, to take control of Europe. That that was never um, part of any kind of Stalinist or later Khrushchev, I mean, name, name, name the leaders. Um, on the other hand, I've talked to relatively high level military people who were stationed near here, US people, in charge of certain military facilities who truly believed that any moment in their term in Germany the Russians were going to come sweeping in and they were convinced they didn't have the facilities to forestall a ground offensive against the Soviet Union, a country that had lost more than 20 million people, a country that was using horsepower to a great degree at the close of World War II to move its military uh, power, yes? Um, <coughs> so there, there, were, there were at that time people like Kagan uh, who wanted to take some of this tension down and I think that's remained an in, in aspect of, of U.S. policy ever since. So there have been any number of uh, uh, military leaders who, 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 in fact, have advocated, like MacArthur did in 1950. He advocated a first strike, nuclear strike, on China. And he was only the U.S. commander in the Pacific. Curtis LeMay was in charge of the um, uh, SAC, the Strategic Air Command, which operated the battalion of B-52 bombers. The United States had, early in the Cold War, bombers in England and Greenland, 
that were capable of carrying nuclear uh, weapons at high altitude into Russia. And Curtis LeMay was an advocate of first strike. A number of people have. And so you have, in the U.S., you, you, you have had um, people, uh, not only the lunatic a woman who was the vice presidential candidate with John McCain, uh, Sarah Palin, who back during that election cycle said something in public about how she would welcome a U.S. war with Russia. And that generally wasn't even picked up by the press. Um, so, so we have, you know, in the, in the political spectrum, we have um, this Armageddon lunacy. On the one hand, MacArthur fell into it. Curtis LeMay fell into it. Uh, John McCain, who was the presidential candidate when Obama was first elected, when the situation in Ukraine blew up, he simply announced, and he's a powerful senator, he simply said, this will not stand. What does that mean? Right? I mean, that means what? That NATO charges into the Ukraine, takes control of the Ukraine? It's not very clear, but I, I think uh, what you have in the case of the United States in terms of U.S. US power projection You've always had uh, people who, uh, who advocate active military intervention regardless of the cost. Now, in other words, we finally got Kissinger to the point where he would say it's mutually, ex mutually assured destruction. There is no super weapon. There never will be a super weapon. And soon, somebody's going to get drone capacity, right, uh, besides the United States. And so there are people who, who've long argued that the U.S. has these super weapons. They have to use them while they have the edge. And then you have the realist camp that recognizes spheres of influence and simply looks at the situation in the Ukraine and Crimea and shrugs and says, well, what would the U.S. do in a situation like that? Hmm? Right next to the U.S. border. And so there's this, there's this ongoing dispute that is allowed, up to the moment at least, a certain kind of stability. Yeah. At the end of the day, a certain kind of pragmatism comes in uh, Truman fired uh, MacArthur. He should have fired him earlier, but he fired him. Uh, Curtis LeMay was kept in a box. He never had the autonomy to do what he said he wanted to do over and over again. Um, and we have, like, General Clark in uh, the former Yugoslavia, another loose cannon, so um, I, I think there's a certain ambiguity here that you have to admit to, that you have to face. Uh, and at the end of the day, thus far in history, which is a pretty good hypothesis and the only hypothesis we've got, uh, when, it, when it really matters, uh, there's a certain amount of pragmatism here. I, I say one last thing about this. Um, Ray McGovern, I don't know if you heard his name, but he gave the CIA presidential briefing to many presidents, including Bush the Younger. In other words, he was the man that went from the CIA every day, maybe not Sunday, I don't know, every day the president would get up and you would, you, each president has this encapsulating um, summary statement early in the morning. Mr. President, all night long the CIA has worked, the other intelligence services have worked, the embassies tell us this, that, and the other thing. In the last 24 hours, this has happened. These are the things you should know about. This is Ray McGovern. 
he retired from the CIA, and he's become an active dissenter against U.S. militarism. About two years ago, I heard him speak, and at that time, he was convinced that within a matter of a week, the U.S. was going to militarily attack Iran. There was an Iran crisis at the time, and so you have people even at this level, right, making public statements. This was not a private statement to me at all, uh, but a public statement. I was in the audience. The consensus position, not only McGovern, but there were several very high-level experts on Iran. <clears throat> they all argued there was going to be a meeting in Geneva. That meeting was a charade, and the United States was going to attack Iran. What's going on now? The United States and Iran are apparently are cooperating over Iraq. Hmm? Well, I'm, I'll stop there. Mich interessiert auch das Potenzial von gesellschaftlichem Widerstand gegen äh, diese beschriebene Machtpolitik und gegen den Militarismus. Und da konkret ähm, die Frage, wie, wie stark ist in den USA im Moment die organisierte Linke? Ähm, wie sieht es aus mit der Friedensbewegung? Also das, was ich hier in Deutschland mitbekomme, ist vorwiegend Code Pink. Ähm, die Aktionen, die, die sind übers Netz weit verbreitet. Und die ähm, Rolle der Gewerkschaften, aber hier auch nochmal speziell IWW, weil ich denke mir, die müsste doch eigentlich eine Gewerkschaft sein, die eine andere Haltung hat als die vorhin beschriebenen. Um, äh, Code Pink, the number one person in Code Pink is Medea Benjamin. And she's a one-man band, as they say in English. She's everywhere at once. When the Iraq war was starting, I had the uh, opportunity, uh, which I'm sure Medea Benjamin has forgotten, to be one of three speakers uh, in a confrontation against the State Department over whether the U.S. should or should not intervene in Iraq. I think you could guess my position. Um, and I have to say that um, I never have been in a public place with somebody like Medea Benjamin. Uh, she had the skill to come up with exactly the right phase because there was a debate even though the State Department didn't show up. Uh, Neoconservatives carried the other side of the debate and I found out that Medea Benjamin can think more accurately than I can, and she can think twice as fast as I can. Um, so, um, but, mm, code, pink, code pink aside, um, I would say in my lifetime, the left has never been in worse shape, worse condition. Aside from Medea Benjamin, you can hardly find anything. I know that Noam Chomsky gives speech after speech after speech and he says, well, I go to, from one community to the other community and the other and there are all these activists and they're working on local issues. They probably are. I don't care about local issues. I care about U.S. militarism. Even in the Vietnam War, you could not get people to move from, we don't want to die in Vietnam because it doesn't have any meaning, to think about the structural causes of war. There's never been, in my lifetime, opposition to U.S. militarism per se. The word doesn't exist. When you use the word militarism, there's only one image that comes to mind, Prussia. Right? But the U.S., is an equally militaristic society. And this is not a rhetorical statement on my part. It's, it's, it's something we can document uh, in, a, in, a, in, in, in many ways. Um, you would think that 
over 10 years of constant U.S. interventions, two low-level small wars that have completely failed, you would think that the populace would be articulate in its opposition. It's not. It's the war fatigue. People are saying, well, we didn't get anything out of it. That's a very passive stance. That's completely different from saying, not only do, did this not work, but the ideas behind it don't work. And we don't want this as national policy. Um, I can't think of a single senator or congressperson now uh, who, who will articulate the kind of arguments I've presented tonight. The last one I can remember was a man named Ron Dellums from California, from Oakland, California. And he also happened to be black, and Oakland is a black political congressional district. And so as long as you were delivering to that community, that community didn't care what Ron Dellum said. They didn't care that he was one of the most ostracized Congress people in history. And right now, there's no, nobody from a safe congressional district, even black con congressmen, who articulate what Dellums once articulated. There were some think tanks that Dellums was very... Uh, very linked to in Washington, um, that's not there really any longer. The think tanks are there, but the discourse is gone. Ah, but finally, the IWW. I don't know how many of you know of the IWW. The IWW ceased to exist essentially in the Red Scare after World War I. I could say a few things about the IWW, which I won't, from a personal standpoint. They're a fascinating union. Um, they tried to organize the Star, uh, Starbucks workers in some Starbucks in the United States. Uh, they certainly had a consistent anti-militarist line. Um, but uh, U.S. state terror against them virtually eliminated the Wobblies. Uh, they're the... Uh, uh, the industrial... I'm trying to think of it. The IWW stands for the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, yes, Industrial Workers of the World, IWW. Hmm? Um, they were a militant... Uh, largely anarchist union that primarily had their influence in the west of the United States, which is where I grew up. Uh, but I don't think you could find more than one person in 10,000 who's ever heard of the IWW in the United States today. So uh, to summarize, I would say that the opposition couldn't be weaker uh, than it is now in terms of the entire history of the United States. Um, even groups like the Mennonites, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mennonites, a uh, German pacifist Protestant sect that shifted to the United States and actually to Mexico too. Um, the Mennonites always rally as pacifists against this, but you probably couldn't find one person in 10,000 in the United States who'd ever even heard of a Mennonite. Hmm? So yes, there are a few people around. Um, but no, there's no organized, uh, concrete movement. <laughs> and the unions, uh, they really have not rallied to the cause. There's a group called the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Once in a while, I used to write some small things. I had a lot of contact with them. Um, now, I, I, I just don't even hear of them. I know they're around. They have cake sales. They bake cookies. Uh, 
Um, they have posters that say war is not nice for children and other living things. But there's just no discourse. And the reason, I think, is if you question U.S. militarism after 9-1-1, you are giving uh, indirect support to terrorism. You're an enemy of the state in the home of the brave and the land of the free, where we believe in democracy and free speech. We believe in democracy, we believe in free speech, and we have no space for free speech for anyone who questions any aspect of the U.S. military construct. Thank you very much.